Good evening. Welcome to the October 27th, 2021. Uh, meeting of the Chappaqua Central School District Board of Education. The board has been an executive session and then a work session and then executive session again. Um, so can I have a motion please at 7.38 to uh, reconvene the public session? I move. A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I would love to have our guests from West Orchard lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance this evening please. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you guys so much. And because you are by far the most interesting part of our meeting tonight, we're going to have you guys go first, okay? So I'd like to um, thank you, Mrs. Grasso. Welcome to West Orchard Elementary School. And um, Mrs. Stover and Mr. Skook, thank you for uh, facilitating this presentation with us this evening with our esteemed guest. So I'm going to turn it over to you. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ackerman, Board of Education, and the Central Office team. You know, we were sidebarring over here earlier, and they said, nervous, judging from that pledge, you know, and you do just fine. So, welcome again. We're excited to chat with you this evening about some literacy work that we've been doing uh, through our Teachers College reading and writing curriculum. But at the same time, uh, talking about student identity and getting students to take a close look at themselves as the teachers facilitate uh, different activities and different learning experiences that help them really get to know who they are um, and, and their backgrounds, their families, their cultures, all that. So just a short quote here from Sarah Ahmed. When we recognize students' identities, we make space for them in the classroom. So students need to see themselves in the classroom and in the curriculum uh, to shed light on their hopes, dreams, talents, family histories, etc. So tonight we have two second graders here, two third graders, and two fourth graders. The second graders will talk to you about some of the picture books and windows and mirrors texts with Ms. Stover. And then I'll facilitate some fourth grade work with poetry and third grade work with narrative writing. Last year, through a generous grant from the Chappaqua School Foundation, received a curated collection of texts to support the diversification of their classroom libraries. Recognizing that books are both windows through which readers learn about others who may be different from them, and mirrors where they see themselves and their families reflected in the characters and stories, these texts extended classroom libraries to include more authors, characters, and storylines that accurately reflect the diversity of our community and our world. Within every unit of study of Writer's Workshop, there are recommended mentor texts that match the genre that students are writing in. Teachers engage students in reading and examining these texts so that they can then approximate the author's craft moves to lift the level of their writing. Where appropriate, our teachers have been utilizing texts from the Windows and Mirrors collection as mentor text. An example of this is incorporating the text Jabari Jumps into the second grade personal narrative unit. During this unit, which is entitled Lessons from the Masters, students apprentice themselves to authors and study how they use craft to convey meaning. Students then replicate these moves in their own writing to craft powerful, small moment stories. Nicolin is going to share an excerpt from his small moment story and the ways in which the craft moves used by Gaya Campbell inspired his writing. Oh, 
Yeah. No, I'm not gonna read my book. I'm gonna read the uh, Jabari Jumps first. You wanna read the part in Jabari? Okay. So you're gonna read this page, and the craft moves from this page. Jabari watched the other kids climb the long ladder. They walked all the way out of the end of the board as big as tiny bugs. You see there's a comparison called as big as tiny bugs. Then they stood on the edge. They sp spread their arms and bent their knees and sp sprang up up and then they dove down 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 splash looks easy jabari said but when his dad squeezed his hand jabari squeezed back so you can see the comparisons and details and then can you show oh, hold on you can close that page we'll go right to you and, and now share how you... After that, I went to whale watching. I saw 10 whales. The boat was as fast as a roof. There were sharks, too, and other animals. But then, no, I felt scared. I thought I would fall out of the boat. And explain mm -hmm. which craft moves you used. I used the comparison, feeling, thinking, and details. Okay, thank you for sharing. Yep. So, Mrs. Stover, can you yes. just explain what we just saw? Please? Absolutely. So, what we saw was Nitlin was sharing the part of the story where he noticed specific craft moves that the author had used. So, he noted that there was a comparison, that the author had used really explicit details, including how the character was thinking and feeling. And then he shared a page from his own writing where he also made a comparison, included what he was thinking and feeling, and also told some smaller details. And you could see the way that he had gone back and even revised his writing to include some of those even after after his first draft. Thank you. And if you look, you can see it right on the screen. Mm -hmm. You see right there? On the big screen. Yeah, right there. Okay. okay you can go ahead, Mark. Yep. Bye. Every unit in Reading Workshop has a pre-planned interactive read-aloud that either strengthens the work of the unit or builds students' critical thinking skills in a text that is above their independent reading level. During an interactive read-aloud, the teacher is reading the text aloud to the class, pausing to model their own thinking aloud or to ask pointed questions to guide students toward higher level thinking. Students turn and talk, stop and jot, and or discuss their ideas as a whole class. Our literacy staff developer, who is a former TC staff developer, used the unit read-alouds to plan additional interactive read-alouds using the books from the Windows and Mirrors collection. These plans align with the goals of the unit and also support the goals of our ruler curriculum. Go ahead. In second grade, the first unit in reading is focused on reading process skills, building on learned strategies in first grade. The work of the read aloud within this unit is to prepare students for future units in which they will develop interpretation skills, which includes noticing story elements, inferring character feelings, and the lessons that characters learn. So Theo is here to speak to some of the higher level thinking work that he and his peers did in the book Dreamers by Yui Morales. Okay. So open up to the first page. Okay. That was marked. I can do this. You can do it. <laughs> so the question that was posed by his teacher on this page was, what do you notice about how the character is acting? He's a maze, and, he and what does that tell you about the type of character that she is? That she appreciates beautiful things. Okay. 
on Etsy. And then at the end of the text, you can go ahead one more slide. Okay. The students were prompted to start thinking about the author's message or the lesson that the characters may have learned in the story. So Theo, when you listened to your teacher read this book, and I know you also had the opportunity to listen to it in Spanish through Epic, what were you thinking the message of the story was? Do not be afraid of new places. Be brave. Learn to read is a gift. Books take you on adventures. So through these interactive read-alouds, again, the students are being posed questions that allow them to advance their inferential thinking skills, their higher-order thinking, at a level above what they may be able to read independently, which prepares them for future reading work. Thank you, Ms. Stover. So to continue in fourth grade with some of the uh, literacy work, particularly related to poetry, our students uh, wrote two poems that reflect that, and I'll talk about teachers teach certain skills and strategies and uh, ways to write poetry. So there's listening for line breaks, patterning through repetition, using comparisons, seeing through the poet's eyes. So this is just a snapshot of some of the curriculum for this particular poetry unit. And these are some visuals that the teachers use to engage students in these strategies. Uh, they demonstrate them, they practice them independent, uh, with guidance, and then students actually generate uh, their own poems as a result. Now the inspiration for these two particular poems we're going to highlight are from some picture books, Where Are You From? and The Best Part of Me. So I'm going to ask Leah to talk about uh, this picture here, which is a collection of poems from her class, and then to talk about the process she went through and culminating with the reading of the poem. So this here is everyone's poem. Everyone picked a body part that was important and special to them, and they made a poem. Um, to write them, we basically picked a body part that that could make us do some things that we like, and that make us like feel special. And we took notes of things that we could do with that body part, and we sort of experimented with them in different ways and made them into sentences. And so that was how we made our drafts. And yeah. My legs. Without my legs, I couldn't run. Without my legs, I couldn't do some things that are fun. I couldn't flip. I couldn't twist. I would not be able to plant. It would be harder to dance. My legs are like swings that can go on the ground and can make me walk. My legs are like blue robots, always that way. My legs are like magical creatures. So that's kind of one rendition of uh, some identity work. Another is inspired from the I Am From book. And I'm going to ask Mila to talk about uh, that process with her class, uh, which is here. This slide's out of water, Mila, but same thing that Mila did talk about what inspired you to write this, how you learn from your teacher, and then what your draft is like. Um, this is this is everyone's poem about where we are from, and basically, I think that where we are from is basically all those memories and all those stuff that we had in the past, and, um, came over from where from where we 
This is the draft for my first parag paragraph. It's about my outside, like in my backyard, and what I used to do when COVID hit and we were inside online school. And we just think I can talk I feel like things up. And this is mine. Where I'm from. I am from the tiny tree. Up the rock falls on down the side. The catching frogs parade. The stream flowing past my boots. Snakes living around my feet, screaming in terror. I am from escaping waves, sand forts, the evil stingray, prescription bottles, warm blue, concierge, concierge lounge food, lousy pot, sharing beds, big bandages. I am from Kosher Deadly, corned beef, pastrami and turkey, crystal animals, open top tea at the piano, perfume that smells like butts, Gucci and Chanel bags. Too fancy clothing. I am from Italian for Thanksgiving, Cricket, Sadie, Blum Floor Houses, Jacks and Pretzel Rods, Cousins Much Older, Diablo. I am from Mac and Cheese in the Farm, Boring Teachers at Religious School, Hand Artichokes, Frozen Burritos, Car After Bus, Sneaking Candy. I am me. And to conclude, we're going to highlight some narrative writing from our third graders, whose inspiration was uh, engaging in generating an identity map. Before they did that, and during this writing unit, they learned craft moves as well, like using action words, describing the setting, adding dialogue, etc. So this activity of generating an identity map is uh, facilitated by the teacher and the teacher engages students in thinking about all these aspects of who the child is and we're going to start with Emma's identity map and she'll talk about that she'll talk about her draft and then read the favorite, her favorite part of her story. Um, my identity map is Emma 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 um, a big family to run with the picture and it was my story revolves around them. Um, and I really like cars and I did a lot of new houses. I have post-its and um, markers and I also have some called rubies. I need it to the beginning. And I will try to talkingly, questionably, and snapshotly. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Okay. And Suwa is going to wrap it up with a similar format, talking about her math and talking about her writing process. So this is my identity map. I took the things that are really important from my life and then I put them all in my identity web because it's what makes me me, and I don't think I'd be what I am now if it wasn't for this. So I play golf, and I have an older sister. And one thing I love doing is drawing. It kind of calms me down when I'm able to do this. And at home, I'm able to speak Korean with my family. So that's my identity. This is my 
This is my full draft. Today I'll be sharing with you the beginning part of it, which is probably the strongest moment to me. It was a chilly night in the car. Are you there yet? I asked. No, said my mom. <sighs> I dangled my legs. I tried to stay still, but I couldn't. Um, that, I said in my most innocent voice. Are we there yet? No. I looked at the little screen on the car. Two more hours, but it felt like forever. The different colors is when we went back to revivals. Yellow is dialogue, blue is description, and red is action. So we went back to check if what we wrote made sense, and if we didn't have a lot of one color, we would make a goal for ourselves to make more of that. So that's what all the colored ones are on our wall. So I hope that gives you a snapshot into some of the literacy work that we've been doing at West Orchard, again, with the identity lines. So thank you, second, third, and fourth. Thank you. So at this time, I would like to ask our students some questions. So Mrs. Stover and Mr. Scope to facilitate the mic. Um, go ahead. I want to start by thanking you all. I know that sometimes it's a little scary to come talk on a stage to a big group of people, especially about something as personal as your own writing. But thank you so much to all of you for sharing that with us. And it was great to get to hear about your experiences. And one thing I noticed in all of your writing, whether it was poetry or fiction, is that you took a lot of sort of universal emotions and made them really personal. And I thought that that was really great. So I'm curious to hear from whoever wants to answer sort of how did you, how did you think about the emotion part of this? How did you think about the feelings and, and try to make them personal, but also that the reader could, could relate to it? Okay, so my mom and dad told me that my dad's grandparents moved here from Italy so I could tell how the character felt when he moved from Texas to Mexico. Um, I did this because um, I was really scared at that moment. And it just all broke up for me before I could think. And it, that could relate because I had never been that scared, but it was actually horrible. My emotions don't led to this kind of, because in each paragraph it means a different thing and a different memory. They all mean like, from a part, like the first one was like outside, as you can see from my draft and stuff. And it's kind of, and it's kind of like it was awesome. Thank you so much. So I have a quick question. Um, who choose the, the the students choose their own texts? Like in the second grade? I mean, oh. Do they choose their own mentor text their or text. the read aloud text? Yes, correct. So for the mentor text. There are venture texts that the classroom teacher engages the whole class in. And then there are other venture texts that students can have independent study of. So they might have a basket of all small moment stories. And then they have some choice as to which ones they would like to study. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say that that was a great presentation and I was very excited to see some of my favorite mentor texts up there. Um, Al Moon, Jane Yolen is one of my favorite, favorite authors. 
Um, and I loved hearing all of your drafts and revision strategies. And um, I still do them too. I still use mentor texts um, to find different types of leads when I have to write something. And um, I use all the different types of craft crafting strategies. I heard um, some onomatopoeias in some of your drafts, and um, I'm really excited that you did this presentation for us. Thank you. I, I am very impressed that you are learning to um, craft and revise your work so early. I think a lot of us learned that a lot later on in school, so I love um, that you're, you're learning this incredibly important skill at such an early age. And, um, I, I just loved how personal all of your stories were, and I know that it must have taken a lot of time to really think, and it's very internal what you were asked to do here, and yet we always collaborate so much uh, in school. So I was curious if you had opportunities throughout this process to maybe hear some of your other friends and peers work and get ideas from them. Was that part of it as well, so that it wasn't all internal? So I was just curious about that. Okay. Did you want to see? It was, so our teacher, Ms. Balbona, sometimes had us partner up so we can try to get inspiration from each other by reading each other's stories. So uh, we read each other and thought if we could maybe add something to theirs and they helped us add on to ours so that we could like help each other. I related to my story to how my family acted when they moved here. Thank you. Thanks so much. I did an awesome job. Um, so I just wanted to say to all of you that I think you're amazing writers and you are such great presenters, and I'm so impressed that you are able to come here um, to do this in front of the board and in front of the audience. So I want to congratulate you for that. And I, I have a question. Um, I found your stories really interesting, and I wondered if uh, when you read your other um, friend's stories, if you felt that Doing this exercise made you understand each other a lot better, and do you feel that you maybe might might have become closer to your to your classmates because you knew each other a little bit better? Do you think that was a worthwhile thing to do? Yeah. Does anyone want to answer? Um, when I read my friend's story, it was about her having a play date. And she was doing all of her favorite things to do, like to play in a playset, to do TikTok, to watch YouTube, to run around, play tag. And I felt like after I knew all of that, it was so fun because you know, I knew all the things she liked to do. When I read my partner's story, it was about her uh, was about her lost and when her parents were playing a game that she didn't like. And I think that that what she did added a lot of details, so that helped me add some details too. When I hear my story, it was about when I got a new game, and I was nervous because I didn't know how to play it. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. So, um, are there any more questions? All right, so we thank you so much for being here with us tonight. You guys did an excellent job. I think time we'd like you, without tripping, to take center stage with Mr. Skoog and Mrs. Stover. And if your teachers want to come up, I know they're in the audience. We're going to do a shot.
on on the uh, on the stage here. So come on. Do you want to take your picture? Okay. No, no, in front of the speakers. You can go in front of the speakers. Can we help here? Okay, are we ready? Does anyone else want to come up? Okay. second we're having a problem with the audio at home so if you could make whatever adjustment needs to be made so people can hear us that would be great thank you thank you mr school thank, thank you Ms. stover thank you okay um so the next item is president's report so i just want to start by thanking our visitors this evening from West Orchard, I think they've all left, but we love having you come to our meetings to share what you're learning and creating in the classrooms. And um, I want to start by just saying I hope everyone is safe and relatively dry after that nor'easter. And also say that I saw a few questions um, yesterday morning on text chains and, and online from families new to our district asking if school was opening on time given the storm. And I just want to assure you that if there are any weather related delays or closings, you will be notified. Um, you should have gotten a notification, for example, we'll meet a delayed start one morning due to Hurricane Ida. And if for some reason you didn't, then check your notification settings with the district. But I assure you, I assure every family, you will know with ample notice in the morning if there are any closings or delays. And in time, you will learn to disable anything that rings if anybody even whispers the word snow. Um, and I also want to mention Halloween is Sunday. So we're so thrilled that our schools are able to have safe and fun Halloween celebrations for the kids this week. So thank you to the administrators, particularly at the elementary schools, for all of the planning and problem solving that went into making that possible. And also thank you to the PTA for imagining and reimagining uh, COVID safe Halloween activities. Halloween is one of the highlights, as we know, of childhood. So thank you to everyone who is making sure our kids can celebrate safely and have a great time. Um, and speaking of a great time, the food truck night uh, hosted by the Chappaqua Schools Foundation was Monday night, and it was a great event. And thankfully, the weather held out for that. Um, so the kids had a great time. The food was awesome. And so thank you to CSF for a great community event. Um, we just came from a work session where we continued our work as a board with insight on the audit around equity and inclusion for the district. They have been conducting focus groups with various stakeholder groups, and we're happy that they're back on campus continuing this very important work. So I'm actually going to turn to Jane now, who attended a really interesting webinar on the framework for culturally responsive classrooms, and she's going to fill us in on that. Yes. Um Thank you. Um, yeah, through the uh, Westchester Putnam School Board Association, we are offered a lot of uh, uh, board training. Uh, usually it's in person. Obviously, it's been on webinars, and I was able to view this one uh, in, uh, over the last, it was about 10 days ago. And this really gave a nice summary of the New York State culturally responsive framework. And it's our, all of our work that we're doing right now in terms of our equity audit, all the work that we're doing in our schools right now is based on this and it, it gave a very good summary. I know some parents may not understand how this all came about and so I was just going to briefly state a couple of principles that they discussed here and first of all let the, the community know that this all came about for a couple of years ago but in January 2018 the New York State Board of Regents came up with a framework for what they call culturally responsive and sustaining education. And this was after consulting with many experts, school leaders, teachers, also students, um, parents, etc. So, and it, it's steeply based in research. And what the four guiding principles are that, that I thought it would be helpful for the community to know is to create a welcoming and affirming environment, to have high expectations and rigorous instruction, to have inclusive curriculum and assessments, and to have ongoing professional learning and support. And the goal here is really to help create students who experience academic success, 
success, who are sociopolitically conscious and socioculturally responsible, and who have a critical lens through which they can view and challenge what may be inequitable systems of access, power, and privilege. And really for us, this has always been a part of our strategic plan that we've done over the past, uh, you know, con uh, refined over the past several years. And it's, it's part of the portrait of, a grad, portrait, excuse me, of a graduate that we have sent out to the community um, several times. And what we are trying to do, as I think a lot of you may know, is we are trying to make sure that all of our students graduate with the, the, the set of skills and the education that they really need to be successful and, and, and mentally healthy as well as they go out into the world. So I think it was a very good background for me to have as a board member. I think it's also helpful to know for the community that you can go on the New York State Education Department website and see all of this. It's really very accessible. And two important takeaways from this, which I just thought were you know good to share tonight, was that they did discuss the importance of having a director of equity inclusion. We now have Philip Marcus here in our school. And uh, just like we have a director of athletics, a uh, director of special education, that this can be crucial in moving the work forward. And also that this work can be especially important in more homogeneous communities because the students need to understand that people they will likely be working with and living with in other places, and they need to understand and and have the skills they need to interact effectively no matter where they are out in the work and the workplace, et cetera. So again, this goes back to the fact that this is really important work. It's very much in line with our strategic plan and in terms of what we want to see in the profiles of our graduates. And I just thought it would maybe provide some background as to why this work is ongoing and how important it is for all of our students. That's it. Thank you so much. And it's yeah, I just wanted to mention, Jane, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for going and, and bringing that back to us. And I just also um, wanted to thank my colleagues over at the Westchester Putnam School Boards Association because, you know, in case people don't know, that's an organization that represents the school districts in Westchester and Putnam, and, and they serve a wonderful function uh, in bringing programs and information and, you know, training on board governance and the opportunity for school districts to come together to share best practices. So, you know, I just want to thank um, Karen Belanger, who's the executive director of West Putt, and Stacey Ago, another program coordinator, um, for bringing these, these types of programs. So, um, yeah, their you know, programs are fantastic. Thank, thank you. They for, are. Thank you for going. Yeah, we're really lucky um, that as as a board and as board members, we have access to a lot of really great programming that's you know, helpful training for us too through West Putt and also through NISBA, the New York State School Boards Association. Um, their annual conference was about a week ago and it was meant to be live. It was not live, it was virtual. Um, and I went to their pre-conference law seminar, which is always super helpful and an update on all of the uh, updates in education law over basically the course of the last year. So that was I don't have anything particular to report from that, but it was always helpful and informative to just get an update um, from school lawyers just on, on things that are, whether they're, they're cases that occur in New York or not have impact on education here um, and across the country. So it, that, was, that was useful and interesting. And we do like to, to keep the community informed on when we're going to these trainings and such because we want you guys also to know what what resources we're tapping into and what we're learning and what we, we continue to, to keep ourselves um, informed so that we can you know, take that back here and, and better serve the community. Um, so I want to just touch briefly on the proposed form based code. Um, we have submitted via our attorney a comment to the town board outlining our concerns that remain around the FGEIS in advance of the vote on the finding statement, which is scheduled for November. Um, we both as a board collectively and as individual board members have gotten a number of questions from community members who are confused, frankly, and concerned about the process and our role in it. Um, so we will be sending a community-wide email tomorrow, hopefully addressing both of these questions. And I just want to reiterate that this board takes no position on the form-based code. 
we only seek to make sure that as fiduciaries of the school district, which is an interested agency in this process, we provide as accurate data as possible so that the town board can then make informed decisions. Lastly, this week was Dr. Ackerman's birthday, so if you see her in person, wish her a happy birthday. <laughs> And that concludes my question. <laughs> oh, that's embarrassing. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so we have a community update, and I'm the primary speaker this evening. We don't have a very uh, rich board agenda, which is fine. We've had a, uh, a few meetings where we've had a lot of items, but tonight we just aren't in that space. So I do want to provide uh, some COVID updates and some adjustments that we're making moving forward. So. Uh, first, you can see our vaccination information. If you are not a part of the Greeley student body, um, this is the first time that you're seeing that Greeley is like at 96% vaccinated at this point. So because they're so high in their vaccination rates, we've made some adjustments, which I'm going to talk about in a minute about how we're approaching lunch and, um, and uh, how we're structuring music because so many of our students have, uh, parents have chosen to have them in be vaccinated, our numbers continue to be high in our schools. They fluctuate because we have new staff come on um, during the course of the school year. So if you see like one weekend was 98%, the next weekend it was 100, then it was down to 99, that, that'll happen as we hire uh, staff to fill different temporary roles. Um, and then you'll see that our transportation, while we have more, we have more drivers receiving the vaccine, there is that period of time at which they need to um, wait in order to be fully vaccinated and it, it takes a few weeks depending on what shot they receive so but I am happy to say that we do have more and more um, contract staff choosing to be vaccinated and then just so you know just to keep you updated on our testing numbers this is from um, oh, this was from Monday I'm sorry not Tuesday but you can see our, our numbers are pretty consistent and that we even though we're offering testing to all of our students who are unvaccinated and to our vaccinated staff as required by the New York State Department of Health. We don't have many families taking advantage of that on a weekly basis or staff. And then we do have a very small number of people who are required to test, submitting um, private tests through our testing management system. And you'll notice on the agenda tonight, there is a resolution approving us to move forward with testing on vaccinated students and coaches for the winter season. So um, that's on the agenda for your consideration. Um, and then in terms of our quarantine numbers, this is where we were the last time that we met. Uh, this is where we are today. We did have three exposures, one as recently as um, this afternoon. So we do have a, 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 a number of students who are out and that primary exposure has been happening on, on transportation. Um, so in, in conversations with parents, most are very understanding. Um, but I also want to share that I'm continuing to advocate with my colleagues around the quarantine um, procedures that are in place for buses. While it's three feet in classes, it's six feet on the bus. We're trying to help, um, not trying to help, but we are asking for reconsideration. So that could be moved to a three foot radius because that would impact um, much, less, much less students. Um, however, they're, they're not willing at this point to shift, but maybe they will be in the future. I, I've been feeling a lot of phone calls about exposure at, um, and school exclusion for students who were attending activities not on our grounds. And um, while I appreciate that parents are calling me, asking me to advocate to the Department of Health to have their students removed from quarantine, I'm not in a position to do that because those aren't our supervised activities. They're not on our property. I can't verify what happened at those events. So while I completely understand the frustration that parents are experiencing by decisions that are made by the Department of Health at these private activities that don't happen in our space, um, I do want to just clarify what my role is. And my role is to make sure students aren't in school who aren't supposed to be here as determined by the Department of Health. But also um, the understanding that we at a moment's notice will revise, um, we will act on a revision of that decision by the Department of Health and then we are always accessible. Um, so if the Department of Health does allow students to, release, to be released from quarantine, we will call families immediately, but we won't be advocating or making decisions um, on, on, on on that front, since these, these activities are totally off of our property and not under our supervision. Okay, so just um, some adjustments in, in terms of forest really So it's starting to get colder out. And um, let me just go over with you 
just some department of my picture didn't pop up something happened there but let me just go over uh, with you the language from the guidance so the first is that when students are in band or eating they need to be six feet apart from each other um, and that we need to think about where students are eating and the recommendation is that that not occur, occur in the regular classroom and that within these parameters we should not exclude students from schools if we can't meet them. Oh, there's my picture. I should have I did a double click. Sorry about that. But also, so when you think about what that guidance says and um, in terms of Greeley and how we're structuring our activities in Greeley, it's also important to know that consistent with CDC guidance, all close contacts with someone um, who, who is COVID positive must quarantine unless they're fully vaccinated. So basically, in Greeley, if you have someone who's COVID positive, there's very stu few students who need to quarantine because mostly all of the students are vaccinated. So given that consideration, uh, this is what we have decided to do moving forward. Uh, something happened here. How do I go back? We did something weird here. Hold on a second. Can you move me back one yeah. slide, please? You're good now. Go ahead. Okay. So in the in the in the Greeley cafeteria, and we've met with our families. Andrew and I met with our families last week, and we've already started this. Um, in the cafeteria, we're going to have open seating, and we're going to ask that when students aren't eating, they keep their masks on, and that they limit uh, their masks off to 10 minutes when they're sitting at a table and they're not six feet from each other. We've done it, it's, it's not a problem. Uh, we also, in the academic comments, will have desks positioned at six feet, so if kids wanna be in a space where they know they're guaranteed to be sitting six feet away from someone else, we have that space available. And then we've opened up all the other spaces in the building to eat. So kids can sit in the hallway, they can sit in the lobby, they can um, go in different, they can go outside, just so we have more space for kids to be able to um, eat by themselves if they want in their own space. We feel like this is the most reasonable way for us to approach the winter months. And remember, we have kids moving off campus and eating at Whole Foods or Starbucks or wherever, they're, you know, when they walk across the street. So we found that this is working for us at this time, and I think this is a reasonable approach given the high vaccination rate we're experiencing at Greeley. Now, in terms of music, the, the issue that we're having is that we have one concert band where it's really difficult to have all of our seats spread apart six feet because of the space in that room. And remember, we have some limitations right now and the spaces we're able to use, which I'll give you an update on because they're under construction. So um, right now, in terms of our concert band, where we have multiple grade levels in, in that given band room. We are spreading kids out to the greatest extent possible. But we also told families that if they had a concern that they wanted us to understand about that, um, that they just needed to call their AP and we would work with them on where, that's, where their child was positioned in the, in the band room. And that um, when students are engaged in concert band inside, those, are, those who aren't involved in wind instruments would have their mask on. So we're doing our best to operate within the context of the space that we have available, but this is when um, Ray can't play outside. Like he's still able to play outside, but it is getting colder, so it's gonna become more and more difficult. All right, so for the elementary and middle school band, we are gonna start moving towards allowing there to be instruction inside. I'm not talking to you about lunches because all students are able to sit six feet apart inside, so that's like a non-issue for us. But for band, um, we are able to hold our classes in our buildings with the number of students we have in the largest class, maintaining that six foot distance. So we are gonna move forward with having band inside as the weather gets colder or as the fields get wetter. Um, and so we are gonna, we will begin to have band starting on Friday back inside and again, kids who are not playing wind instruments will be masked. And then uh, I'm gonna send a notice out to our, our four through eight parents tomorrow in the morning, let them, letting them know we're moving in this direction and have them, and ask them to reach out to their assistant principal or their principal if they have any concerns. Any questions about that?
So only that what we've seen at Greeley with the super high vaccination rate amongst our kids, as we're starting to get really promising news about the availability of the vaccine for all our students, if we can hit those vaccination rates at all our schools, could we potentially loosen some of our requirements at the lower grades or will we at least have fewer kids quarantined? Well, we'll definitely have less kids quarantined and we're already having conversations at the middle level about opening locker use back up to seventh and eighth grade because their vaccination rates are very high. So I anticipate being able to move in more in that direction as more and more students become vaccinated. So I, I, I feel that our school community is in a much different place than other districts because the 96% vaccination rate at Greeley is really um, awesome. unbelievable. It's really unbelievable. And so, Chris, do you know what the average is? In, oh, I, in I, I, Chester, is there? Yeah, that's data? it. It's a great question. They haven't asked us that specifically, and there's inconsistency on um, the collection of that information across districts, but we made a concerted effort to track our vaccination rates. So we set up a system through our screening process that allowed us to do that um, maybe differently than other places because we knew that would be important here to us when we were making decisions. Um, but what I can say to you is that any time I've explained our vaccination rate to anyone, they've been completely impressed by it. I mean, because it's, it's so incredibly high. And we haven't had to quarantine anyone at Greeley yet. And that's true for the bus, too, because I know you said that's where most of this, where kids are landing in quarantine. So once a kid is fully vaccinated, they're not subject to bus quarantine. Right, only if they become symptomatic. So right. what happens is if you're close contact, you go on the list. And then the Department of Health will call you and ask you if you're okay. But you still come to school unless you feel sick. Sure, I think, I think we're seeing a lot of the fruits of our efforts. I mean, Christine, you and the administration did a yeoman's job the last year and a half to get us to this point through, um, I guess, a policy but practices and, and, and working with the DOH and uh, Westchester County to, to understand how we manage a district in a pandemic. And we, we have these numbers, but I think that's that just didn't happen, that didn't happen overnight. That happened with a lot of work by you and Adam and Tony and the rest of the administration. So thank you. I appreciate that. I also want to acknowledge we haven't, as a district, had any kind of vaccination site here for our families because we took the position that there are many other communities that were in need of that level of support from the Westchester Department of Health um, because of their unique situation. And so I, I just want to acknowledge our families making that effort to take the time to go through the vaccination process with their kids to ensure that we were in a space where we could be making decisions like that um, at, their, at, 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 at their convenience um, for the benefit of the of the district, so I do, I do really appreciate that. Okay, let me see what else I have on here. Can you go to the next slide? It's not moving. Can one of you please move the slide? Okay, so I did want to update you on where we are with the gym. We've totally stripped the floor down to the concrete. So they're in the process of uh, um, ordering the wood and redesigning the paint on the floor. It's going to have more of a modern feel that's in line with uh, college gyms. So um, we are on target to be, com to, um, our completion date is still on target to be towards the end of this month. And so I should have a design of what this will look like for you at the next meeting. If I receive it sooner, I'll, I'll email it to you so you can see what it looks like. Go ahead. Uh, how much different is it going to be than what we've had now? Uh, it'll look more sophisticated. Okay. It'll have our new HG on there, and it'll have different tones of wood, and it'll have uh, Horace Greeley in the end zones, I don't know, is that the right word? 
the end zone the right word? I don't think it is. I, I used to play basketball and embarrassing myself. The baseline. Yeah, and the baseline and the paint will be navy blue. It'll 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 look nice. I'll send it. I'll send it to you. Okay. There, it, we, it's going back and forth between um, the athletic department, myself, Joe Gramondo, and the designers to make sure the lines all look right. It's a, like a science. We visited multiple gyms too, just to get. Uh, an, an understanding of what other places look like and also honoring kind of we're more of a tradition having a more of a traditional gym which is because we don't have like that large mascot um, so, so anyway I'll, I'll send it to you but we're, in the, we're, we're well on our way to getting that floor down and having it look fantastic how will this impact um, winter sports do we know at this point yet so we'll be able to move all of our sports for tryouts to our other gyms, mm -hmm. but we should be ready to support all of our student athletes back on campus after Thanksgiving. Great. Okay. How, um, I know that Ida was the, the primary cause of this. So how has that stream been holding up like last night with that storm? And do we think we're okay moving forward? I think it'll be hard to say moving forward will be okay, but we certainly with some remediation work that Joe Gramondo and his team did um, on the side of, of the Greeley gym, you know, this past storm, the, the, the stream did not raise to that level of concern. I, I think it is still something that needs to be monitored and perhaps a future project done to, to help with, with those, you know, every 20 year storms or 50 year storms that might be down the road uh, to make sure we protect our investment in the building. And then, um, just so you know, our auditorium's been prepped, and they're going to begin the um, the remediation process tomorrow. So they'll be pulling down the panel. They're going to start building the scaffolding, and this is also right now um, on time. So I'll continue to update you on our progress. And that is the end of the superintendent's report. Thank you. Um, that brings us to committee reports. Hi. I don't think I have anything to report. Anything no, we'll have um, coming. Not this time, not yeah. for me. No. No, I, didn't. I was going to talk about facilities, but we already spoke about that, so. Um, I have a wellness committee report. So we had our first meeting on November, no, not November, October 19th, last Tuesday. Um, outside the Ed Center, and we we had a few administrators and um, some members of the community, parents, and I was there, and we talked about what possible projects we can take on this year, um, and how can we do that, and what do we need to do. Um, some of the things that we talked about was school lunches, um, school gardens, um, mindfulness, and um, possibly sports nutrition, you know, where we look at um, and think about student athletes. Um, and then we talked about, um, we proposed another date, November 9th, um, at 3.30 to meet. Um, and it's closer to the first one because we felt like we needed um, to kind of, after we brainstorm, talk about and think about how we're going to carry this out. And then there were some um, members of the committee who couldn't attend, um, so we thought it would be helpful for us to have another meeting so that we could um, finalize and focus, you know, on what we wanted to do for the year. And then, you know, future meeting dates and times. That's it. Else? Okay, great. Well, that brings us to the public comment period. Um, we welcome public comments and in respect for each other's time, we ask that you limit your comments to three minutes. Board members may be contacted via email or phone. After the public comment period has been completed, board members may have a discussion amongst themselves regarding the comments presented. So if you'd like to make a com public comment, please come down to the microphone that is being set up right now. Hello, my name
My name is Gina Malmgren, and I am here on behalf of Tracy Potenza, last year's Special Ed Chair, and Amy Andrus, this year's Vice Chair. I wanted to take this time to publicly thank Ellen Doherty for her time here at the Chappaqua Central School District. To simply say thank you is not enough. Ellen came into our district with an open mind and an open line of communication to the members of our special education community. While working with the PTA special education community, I'm sorry, committee, Ellen was honest, she listened, she gave advice and guidance, and most of all, we had a mutual respect for one another. We felt heard during our monthly meetings and every interaction with her. We walked away encouraged that the work we were doing was important and it mattered. At the end of the day, parents felt that Ellen always wanted to do right, the right thing for their child. Special education can be scary and tricky at times, but with Ellen's support and encouragement, it made our PTA roles easier to fulfill, as well as bringing a true partnership back to the special education community here in Chappaqua. Congratulations on your retirement, and I have something I want to present to Ellen. Thank you so much, Gina. children at the elementary school. Oh my God. So, to Chapel Quattrain, you and all those caterpillars that became Buckwell. Oh, when I see Fiona here, that's <laughs> Fiona. That's lovely. That's lovely. Oh my goodness, hold on. Is that Fiona's room? Yes. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much. Anybody else want to make a Thank you. That brings us now to approvals and ratifications. Oh, that wasn't on. Thank you. That brings us then now, if there are no other public comments, to approvals and ratifications. Um, can I have a motion, please, for items 3.1, 3.2, just 3.1 and 3.2, which are uh, minutes of the October 13th and October 20th board meetings. I, I move items 3.1 and 3.2. I second. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, I recommend 4.1 instructional as presented. I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation for item 4.1. I'll second that. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, since she's in the audience, uh, I'd just like to congratulate Jane Mandelman on the receiving tenure. If you approve this, yes, <laughs> we will honor Jamie, Sarah, and Linda in June at our, uh, in, or was it May? In May at our annual uh, tenure celebration. So thank you. Thank you, Warren, for that. Anything else? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. <laughs> I recommend 4.2 non-instructional as presented. I move that we accept the uh, superintendent's recommendation for item 4.2. I'll second 4.2. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. That brings us to five, which is the consent agenda. The use of the consent agenda permits the Board of Education to make more effective use of its time by adopting a single motion to cover those relatively routine matters which are included. Any member of the Board who wishes to discuss individually a particular piece of business on the consent agenda may so indicate, and that item will be considered and voted on separately, thus preserving the right of all Board members to be heard on any issue. It is recommended that the Board of Education approve the following consent agenda. Um, does anybody as a preliminary matter have anything they want to take off the consent agenda? No. Okay. Then tonight's consent agenda, which is 5.1 through 5.10, um, covers CSE summaries, um, disposing of surplus property, uh, various routine agreements, including some to enable our winter sports programs to, um, to proceed. 
Uh, we're very excited that winter sports seem to be underway in a, a relatively normal fashion. Um, and uh, budget transfer and superintendent already has approved. Oh, no, we're not there yet. Okay. So can I please have a motion for the consent agenda, items 5.1 through 5.1 out? Uh, so moved. I'll second. Does anybody have any discussion or questions about anything on the consent agenda? And all in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, okay. Um, item six is uh, acknowledging contracts already approved by the superintendent under board policy 6085. Um, so we have two contracts that we are acknowledging. I will move items 6.1 and 6.2. I second. Any questions or discussion? Uh, no, I would just like to note and just get confirmation, Christine, that this um, item 6.1 is for professional development for our sustainability center. Actually, is that right or is it something different? Do you want to talk about okay. Yeah, uh, Robert Dillon's a consultant that we have access before. He's a, an expert, national expert, if not international, on how um, educators use space. So he's he's wrote he's written the book The Space, a guide for educators, and he recently published one for educational leaders. And we're actually highlighted in that book. The the space a guide for educational leaders has a blurb um, about Chappaqua, and it has many of our pictures um, because of his time here. And he's taken uh, pictures in our middle school steam space here at Seven Bridges. He's done professional development at Bell. He's done professional development for us in L building, um, but he has not yet entered the Greeley steam building. So he's gonna spend his day on November 2nd in the steam building. And uh, he pushes our thinking with all of his uh, access to schools around the country and around the world and how to use those spaces. So we're happy to have him. Okay, so it's not necessarily just the sustainability center. That's right. All of our steam, um, steam curriculum. That's right. Okay, that's great. Sounds great. Um, I do have a question about item 6.2 um, for the translation services. Is that um, something new? Yeah, so we um, engage in a contract of language line, which is a phone based system, which could also send people out in advance if, with advance notice to help support meetings for students and their families. Um, this is a contract specifically with um, an individual that can do Spanish translation services on site if we need. There's been a, a few situations where we needed immediate support and it would have been helpful to have an individual that we had access to, so it was happening simultaneously. Um, also, there are times where it's helpful to have someone come to a home with you, so this would allow us to, to engage Mrs. Sarcon, if, if, if necessary, it's and you pay for the services that you use. Thank you. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. So that brings us to eight tonight, um, which are the financials. And we have items 8.1 through 8.7 which is acknowledgement of the claims auditor's report for September of 21, um, receipt, acknowledging receipt of the appropriation status report for August of 21, um, acknowledging receipt of the revenue status report for August of 21, acknowledging receipt of the appropriation status report for September of 21, acknowledging receipt of the revenue status report also for September 21, um, Acknowledging receipt of the extra classroom activity fund report for September 21 and acknowledging receipt of the treasurer's report for September of 21. Um, I will move items 8.1 through 8.7. Can I have a second, please? I second. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Brings us to our notice of future meetings. Um, on Wednesday, November 17th, will be our next meeting at 7.30 p.m. Um, we will be back here. Um, but then our next meeting after that is December 15th at 7.30. And although that will be the Seven Bridges Middle School presentation, we will hopefully be back in the Horace Greeley Auditorium by the December 15th meeting. Um, so it is now, hold on, 8.50 p.m. Um, 
This is Ellen's last meeting. Ellen, that's not allowed. So let me, it is such a privilege to, to, to work with all of you, and it's been an incredible year. So I, I want to thank you. Christine is amazing. You're a very, very lucky community to, to have her here. And to work on behalf of the students of Chappaqua has, has been a highlight of my career. So thank you. Well, thank you. I, I sort of knew it was November 1st and knew we were getting there and yet did not put two and two together that this was your last meeting. So thank you so much for everything that, that you've done for this community. We will miss you. We will miss Fiona. Yes, I and uh, we wish you all the best. I, Ellen, we couldn't have asked for a better partner to help support our children through the worst public health crisis I think this country has ever faced in you and so I, I thank you so much for joining our team and helping us navigate that extraordinarily difficult time together so thank you on behalf of all the children who you help support and the leadership team who you help mentor along the way so it was a privilege for us to have you as a part of our team and then Jamie we are excited to welcome you to the stage at our next meeting so thank you for helping support us during this transition so. Yeah, and we know that this is going to be a great transition, and we're very excited to have you at the helm. So even if I can't keep track of dates, we know this is going to move very smoothly. <laughs> we're, all not, we're all not really like grasping that it's actually November. No. But Ellen, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. And obviously, from what was spoken here tonight, you, you were a huge balm for a lot of families here in town uh, during a very difficult time, and we are very, very appreciative. So can I have a motion then to adjourn the meeting at 8.52 p.m.? I will move to adjourn the meeting. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned.